Mr. Henry Quick. Madam Deputy Speaker, I stand in support of both bills being debated today. Over the last two decades, cyber warfare has been waged openly between the major powers and increasingly undertaken by middle powers too. Iran and North Korea are frequently mentioned in the international media, but they are not the only ones. The bigger concern is that the increased frequency and sophistication of the attacks are happening. We are seeing more and more use of zero-day exploits being unleashed on the IT systems globally. By zero-day exploits, it means vulnerabilities that not even the authors of the software are aware of, which means that IT users can expect limited protection from. It is useful for us to know well, how the world got, get to where it is, a cyber space dominated by the law of jungle, the jungle, and how did IT, which have revolutionized humanity, get weaponized? And how did this cutting-edge expertise got proliferated? Sadly, the story is similar to that of nuclear weapon proliferation. For many decades, the US, as the birthplace of IT, started as the dominant and sole superpower of cybersecurity. In 2006, the Suxnet attack woke many countries out of the danger of, off the danger of cyber attacks. After Suxnet, countries realized that most civilian infrastructure can get compromised through hacks in industrial automation systems. Some countries and groups started building sophisticated capabilities. As early as December 2009, there were reports of coordinated attacks against IT uh, giants like Google, aimed not just at individual systems, but going after core IP such as the source code and proprietary designs. Another example, in August 2012, Saudi's uh, Armico, the world's richest uh, company, had 30,000 of its computers demolished by malware, all data were wiped out and replaced with photos of a burning American flag. A much larger wave of proliferation happened around half a decade ago. In August 2016, a group called the Shadow Brokers publicly claimed that they have exploited into, uh, they have hacked into the vaults of NSA and stolen a large arsenal of NSA's zero-day exploits. And in April 2017, Shadow Brokers then purportedly shared some of the most powerful code to the public. The world since then saw many more waves of large-scale and sophisticated cyber attacks using tools that were supposedly leaked. Now, how does this change the world? Now, some of the most sophisticated code is now available to groups and nation states. And because the internet respects no boundaries, the rest of the world is at risk. For example, Ukraine was the initial nexus of the NotPetya attack in 2014. The attack started through a software update from a Ukraine tax filing software company. It quickly jumped into the Ukrainian Ministry of Health, to Chernobyl's radiation monitors, and then to the rest of the world. Within months, analysts conservatively estimate the cost of the attack to be more than US dollar $10 billion. Some global insurance even chose not to pay off the damage, as they claimed that this damage, even for companies outside of Ukraine, was due to an act of war. This changing better view affects us, for we have unique vulnerabilities. The obvious scenario facing SAF is a formal cyber attack as part of hostile military action. Consider this. Our next generation SAF pushes C4I to a whole new different level. We will fuse battlefield intelligence from all services, from near and far, from all parts of the battlefield, to determine the right course of action and to get the right assets to respond. C4I is at the heart of this coordination. If our C4I network or military equipment is fully compromised, then a significant amount of SAF capability could be shut down even for a short time. But another kind of serious threat that Singapore must be ever ready for is for global attacks not aimed at Singapore, but nevertheless spill through our borders, given that Singapore is the telecoms, digital, financial, and business hub of the region. Singapore has fully gone digital. I'm not just talking about digital banking or enterprise software. Our hardware infrastructure, like the rest of the modern countries, rely on industrial automation. We are embracing IoT with a multitude of sensors to manage our city-states. In fact, 
our value proposition to the world can be summed up by three words, trust, connectivity, and knowledge. And all these three pillars can be undermined by cybersecurity threat. Beyond attacks on our economy, our society is also vulnerable. It is entirely possible that Singapore could come under constant attack from nations with strong cyber capabilities that seek to destabilize our media, civic organizations, or even political system. If the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee could conclude in 2019 that the U.S. democracy was hacked, what makes us think a small country like Singapore will be spared of ill intentions? And while we have natural vulnerabilities, we must also be cognizant that we are a net importer of IT capabilities and talent. And this makes it harder for us to keep us safe. I would like to just highlight two areas of intense shortage of skills. There's an acute shortage of top-notch IT talent here, which is a concern as IT will increasingly power cybersecurity. Some time ago, I had dinner with a top AI expert in Singapore. He shared with me how within a few years, the top tech companies headhunted away the bulk of the teaching staff of AI at Carnegie Mellon University, which is one of the largest and best IT institutions in the US. Indeed, even if, if even US is short of top-notch IT talent, it's not surprising that Singapore will be short too. Singapore also lacks sufficient programmers skilled in assembly language. Assembly language is used to write software, code for software, to interface with hardware. For decades, assembly language work is seen as basic low-level technology. As such, only a handful of locations, India, China, Eastern Europe, and Taiwan have deep pools of such skill sets. But over time, the industry realized that assembly language helps a hacker manipulate systems at the architectural level. It is most appropriate for building malwares like virus and trojans. In fact, assembly language is the go-to choice if somebody wants to reverse engineer a piece of software that's already compiled. Far from being low-level work, assembly language is now seen as a sophisticated means to subtly hack the chip, the device, or the telecoms equipment. This is what hackers mean when they mean when they say hacking down to the metal. This is a skill that is not easy for most countries, including Singapore, to bridge. In view of our unique capabilities, I'd like to make a few suggestions to SAF. One, set the right culture. DSA need to be as much like Google and NSA, even as it retains its existing military culture. And a key part of the getting the culture right is being bold and innovative in recruitment, growth, and retention of cybersecurity talent. Given that the bulk of cybersecurity expertise available to Singapore may be from the private sector, I hope that DSI can benchmark the salaries of cyber talent to the private sector so we can pull in the right mid-career profession and recruit, uh, retain good staff. So perhaps the salary structure of DSI may have to deviate considerably from the rest of the military. I also hope DSA can find ways of deploying our people to do very useful industry exchanges, attachments, or even sabbatical. The obvious place for our people to spend time with are, of course, the IT security companies. But we should not limit ourselves to that. It's an open secret to the security industry that there are certain countries with thriving pools of IT freelancers and experts capable of writing zero-day exploits. These exploits are then sold to cybersecurity firms or even the dark net. Are we prepared to let our people go to these countries to immerse themselves in those complex environments? I certainly hope so, because they will allow us to have a pulse on this rapidly evolving field. Number two, I hope that DSI should actively participate in this defense exchanges with trusted countries. Because national level threats and attacks can be of a different profile compared to an isolated attack on civilian and commercial IT system. Even if the tools are similar, the motivation, approach, and the end goals are very different. Three, I hope that DSI must ramp up and integrate with and defend the other services from cyber threats uh, quickly. For example, DSI can consider helping SEF architect our network architecture so that certain basic capabilities can stay analog or even offline. This can help us preserve basic capabilities in a, even in the face of an overwhelming attack, which requires time to resolve in the cyberspace. 
I also hope that DSI can be actively involved in securing, securing our IT environment and processes as various SEF units conduct firmware updates of our software and our weapon system and communication systems. Through DSI, I also hope that SEF mandate and implement a software bill of material policy and also help SEF assess the, the risks of the underlying software and hardware components being deployed. At the same time, we should also be cautious of the silo effect. According to some industry experts, the key challenges that the US government face is the silo effect in achieving a stronger cybersecurity defense. Some commenters felt that NSA, given the nature of its mandate, was viewed as unwilling to share the full expertise and know-how with the Department of Homeland Security, which is in charge of cyber defense. Singapore is too small a country to uh, afford the luxury of turf wars, so I hope we bear that in mind as we have a fourth service. Number four, we must safeguard our capabilities very carefully. DSI needs an extreme vigorous process to audit our people and processes and the security of our tools. We have the moral responsibility to ensure that the codes, the tools do not get out because of the potential unintended effect. And last of all, I hope that DSI must work hand in glove with our cybersecurity agency of Singapore, CSA, to protect Singapore. I hope DSA can actively contribute to our uh, critical information infrastructure by probing our CIIs for vulnerabilities. Doing so will also help CSA sharpen their skills on how to keep our CIIs safe. DSI also should help defend our non-military CIIs because not all adversaries draw a line between military and civilian targets. Now, let me conclude. The creation of our fourth service, DSI, opened many new possibilities for SAF. SAF is now in a better position to supplement our existing capabilities with that of the private sector and to keep our military and non-military CII safe. On that note, I'd like to congratulate SAF for the creation of the CII, and I wish success to the founding uh, generation of DSI officers and staff. With that, I stand in support of both bills. Thank you.